This is a mechanism of disease map for endometrial cancer. I'll be talking about the etiology of endometrial cancer, followed by the pathophysiology of the disease and how it might manifest in the clinic or on some labs and imaging results. Um, all of these bubbles are color-coded according to these core concepts listed in this table up here. And if you want to take a screenshot, go ahead and do that now. I'll be clearing all of these items on the flowchart and talking through it all one by one. So at the center of endometrial cancer, the main pathophysiology is a mutation, as in many cancers. And if you break down the types of mutations that lead to cancers, you can either have a loss of function of a tumor suppressor gene or an increasing activity, a gain of function of a proto-oncogene. In this case, the relevant tumor suppressor genes that are, that are worth knowing are P53 and P10, and you can have a loss of function or a null mutation in either of those. The increase in activity happens in the oncogene HER2 slash NU, um, and these also cause other types of cancers as well. So these are not unique to endometrial cancer, but they're worth knowing in this case. If we're going to group the etiologies of endometrial cancer, they can be grouped into estrogen-dependent type 1 and estrogen-independent type 2. So type 1 is related to long-term exposure to high estrogen levels, and there are many things that cause that. We'll talk about it all. Type 2 is estrogen independent, usually related with age, endometrial atrophy, smoking is in this bucket, and some more genetic mutations. So let's start with the type 1 estrogen dependent causes that are all kind of going to link to this long term exposure to high estrogen. Nulliparity is first. This means not having carried a pregnancy to a viable age, so never having carried a pregnancy to more than 20 weeks. This means that you've had more menstrual cycles, and more menstrual cycles means that you've had more exposure to high estrogen throughout a woman's reproductive years. Early menarche and late menopause do the same thing. They increase the amount of menstrual cycles that a woman has had, increase the amount of exposure to high estrogen levels. Some women get unopposed estrogen replacement therapy. This is helpful for some women that have menopause symptoms like hot flashes or maybe headaches or um, maybe vaginal dryness. Those are all um, kind of symptoms that you get when the estrogen starts to drop at age 51 or so when women go through menopause. And usually when you give estrogen replacement therapy, you're supposed to be giving it with progestin, which has a protective effect against the effects of estrogen in the endometrium. When you give estrogen replacement therapy without progestin, that can predispose you to endometrial cancer through this mechanism. Another medication that has a similar effect is tamoxifen. This is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, and it's usually used for breast cancer. So women that have a history of breast cancer might have gotten tamoxifen and might be predisposed to endometrial cancer. Next is metabolic syndrome. This is the syndrome of diseases that includes hyperlipidemia, obesity, type 2 diabetes. This has a couple mechanisms that um, kind of lead to high estrogen state. First, people with metabolic syndrome and obesity tend to have more fat cells, and fat cells contain aromatase. Aromatase is an enzyme that produces estrogen, so that's extra ovarian production of estrogen in the fat tissues. So that directly leads to high estrogen state, which predisposes you to this type 1 endometrial cancer mutation pathway. In addition, in type 2 diabetes, for instance, it's a high insulin state. People with type 2 diabetes have diabetes res or have insulin resistance, so the body's response is to secrete more insulin, and these people might actually be injecting their own insulin. So the high insulin does the same thing. It produces extra ovarian estrogen, and it also causes the direct proliferation of endometrial cells by increasing insulin growth factor 2. So insulin kind of hits this in two different ways, produces extra estrogen and directly increases the proliferation of endometrial cells, which can of course pre uh, predispose you to these mutations. So metabolic syndrome is a bad one for endometrial cancer. There are also some genetic or hereditary disorders that can predispose to high estrogen levels. One example is Lynch syndrome or hereditary non-polyptosis colorectal cancer. Those people tend to have high estrogen and might also be predisposed to endometrial cancer. Now, while we're here, we should talk about some protective factors for this high estrogen state leading to endometrial cancer. As I mentioned earlier with progestin, progestin is just a synthetic form of progesterone, the hormone. Now, progesterone um, is the same thing, has a protective effect against this high estrogen state, and there are some ways to get progesterone, and these are all protective factors for type 1 endometrial cancer. So, multiparity. When you're pregnant, the predominant hormone is progesterone. It um, <clears throat> promotes 
a healthy <clears throat> endometrium during your pregnancy. So the high progesterone state means less menstrual cycles, that's protective. Combined oral contraceptives, these have both estrogen and progesterone, and the progesterone seems to have the dominant effect there. So those can also be pro uh, protective. Lifelong soy diet. So soy helps you make both estrogen and progesterone. And again, progesterone seems to have the dominant effect here as well. So soy diet helps with that. Androgens also kind of have an opposing effect to estrogens. And um, women that get regular exercise, like pretty frequent exercise, they might have a slightly higher androgen state, which might have a protective effect for this estrogen exposure as well. Also worth mentioning is smoking. Smoking decreases your estrogen levels, but it's obviously still not recommended because smoking itself can cause mutations. So smoking is kind of related here by decreasing the estrogen state, but still predisposing you to endometrial cancer and many other types of cancers. Next, this estrogen independent pathway in type two, you can have a genetic predisposition to that. That's specifically the P10 loss of function in the P10 gene. Um, can cause type 2 endometrial cancer, whereas P53 is more of a type 1 endome uh, endometrial cancer. Other factors that affect this endometrial atrophy is being older, um, postmenopausal, of course, and in the United States, African Americans tend to have higher rates of type 2 endometrial cancer. Now let's move on to the manifestations. The key symptom here is abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, and this is usually how endometrial cancer presents. It can happen in premenopausal, perimenopausal, or postmenopausal women. In postmenopausal women, any kind of uterine bleeding is abnormal. So it could be as little as spotting, and that's abnormal, and it should warrant investigation for potential endometrial cancer. In premenopausal women or perimenopausal women, it might be a little trickier to try to identify it based on uterine bleeding. But if a woman has unusually heavy periods or irregular periods, or um, even bleeding in between their menstrual cycles, intermenstrual bleeding. All of those can be signs that there might be endometrial cancer. But again, it's kind of tricky because when you're perimenopausal, perimenopausal, when you're around menopause, your periods start to get irregular anyway. So it's hard to differentiate irregular periods from abnormal uterine bleeding. When you have so much uterine bleeding, of course that can predispose you to being anemic and it can also cause lethargy. So it might originally show up on like lab values if the bleeding is really more severe um, <clears throat> than your typical periods. So this is kind of describing localized disease and localized disease um, can cause abnormal uterine bleeding. When the disease starts to spread, it first spreads contiguously. It spreads to the, to the region right around the, uh, the endometrium. So it spreads to the cervix, it spreads to the other layers of the uterus. This regional extension can cause a new set of symptoms. So of course, regional ex extension can also cause uterine bleeding. It can have a mass effect on the endometrium and cause bleeding that way. You can also have an enlarged uterus, both from the localized disease and from the, from the regional extension as well. This regional extension can also cause pelvic pain, a vaginal mass that the patient might actually be able to feel, or if it's really quite big and enlarging the uterus, it can cause abdominal distension. This might also be noticed on cervical exam. If a woman's going in for a pap smear, for instance, you might see abnormalities in the cervix if the endometrial cancer has spread to the cervix. When the disease starts to spread more, it can become metastatic. So it can spread both hematogenously and through the lymphatics. So both ways that cancers usually spread um, can be seen with endometrial cancer. This can of course present with nonspecific symptoms like weight loss or lethargy. Um, so you can also get lethargy from metastatic endometrial cancer, or it can have symptoms specific to the organ that it spreads to. So for instance, if the endometrial cancer spreads to the lungs, that would be hematogenous spread, and the patient might present with cough or pleural effusion on a chest x-ray, for instance. And this can cause many other symptoms as well, depending on where the metastatic spread goes to. Now, a quick note on how to diagnose this. Usually when you have this kind of uterine bleeding in a postmenopausal woman, the first test you'll do is a transvaginal ultrasound. And what you're looking for here is the endometrial thickness, the actual thickness of that inner layer of the uterus. And if it's larger than four millimeters, that's concerning. Your next step is usually to do a biopsy. One example of what you might see on the biopsy for endometrial cancer is written here. So it might be called endometrial hyperplasia with atypia. 
that um, that atypia is concerning. And sometimes on the biopsy itself, you might have concomitant adenocarcinoma. So this has been a quick review of endometrial cancer with a flowchart for the mechanism of disease. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.